Now, Jean, hello. I'm Ann Brosky, and I'm the Deputy Director of Programming here at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center. And I get the pleasure to welcome and thank you all for being here this weekend for the Cloth is Land Symposium. To start, a land acknowledgement. The John Michael Kohler Arts Center acknowledges that we in Sheboygan County occupy the traditional homelands of the Ho-Chunk, Potawatomi, Menominee, Oneida, and Ojibwa people along the southwest shores of Michigami. This area holds tremendous value to these tribes and their cultural history. Let this acknowledgement remind all that this land was taken from the native people. Let these words increase public awareness as we honor, respect, and support the indigenous peoples who are still connected to the land on which we live. I've also been asked to give some brief remarks about the impact and value of Cloth's land exhibition and insights into the importance of this symposium, especially for the Arts Center. The Arts Center's mission is to create a generative, a gen, excuse me, create, generate a creative exchange, there we go, between artists and the public. As I reflect on the mission, the exhibition, and the symposium, I think about how, as an organization, we have learned to listen, reflect, value, and respond to authentic relationships, time, and being able to be together in a room and have candid conversations. It has been an honor to meet and learn with the artists who have been open to sharing their work with us, and we look forward to their workshops this weekend. Some will also be highlighting community residency moments that they had with us last spring and summer. They not only shared their art, but deepened partnerships in the community. These relationships are important, not only to the mission of our work, but also in being able to ask questions of each other. And note when we as an organization need to take a pause, some time, listen, reflect, and respond. On behalf of the organization, we are truly grateful to all involved over the past couple of years and are thrilled to be here now to learn and share with one another. We are also thankful for the financial support from funders to make this all happen and the partnership with the Payne Arts Center. I know you will be meeting artists, community members, staff this weekend, and there's so many involved to make everything happen. And I would love to name everyone, but um, that will be a long time. And so um, please, as you meet them, thank them and get to know them. Um, I now have the opportunity to give much gratitude and introduce you to the curator of Cloth as Land and the symposium. Pachia Lucy Vane is a designer and curator whose work is informed by a plural pluralversal imagination that speaks from mun-centered knowledge. Crafting Pan Dao textile art, her installation-based designs and curatorial projects blur the boundaries between traditional and modern to navigate complexities around race, identity, and belonging in displacement. With over 10 years of community-based work, Vane has traveled throughout the Mun diaspora in China, Southeast Asia, and the US, curating exhibitions and experiences that sew together more spaces and places to recontextualize history and culture through cloth. She holds an MFA in design from UC Davis and a BA in anthropology from UC Berkeley. Please, let's welcome curator Pachia Lucy Vane. Welcome, and thank you all so much for being here today. Um, it's really an honor um, to be back here at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center and be sharing space with all of you, uh, both the panelists that we've invited along with uh, the facilitators who will be facilitating those panels, 
um, and our workshops um, and all of you as attendees. I'm really excited. Uh, the Cloth is Land, along with the Cloth Origins exhibitions, opened nearly five months ago uh, in November of 2023. And the reception to both shows have really just been phenomenal, uh, not just here in Sheboygan um, and in Wisconsin and even Minnesota, but also in California. Um, and so I'm really excited for this weekend ahead uh, because we've put together something um, that's really going to bring different aspects of the exhibition to life uh, for all of you to experience uh, in ways that are both within and outside of the gallery, along with within and outside of the artworks themselves. Uh, but before we embark on this journey and this weekend together, I do want to take this moment to give thanks um, and to appreciate individuals who have made not only the show, but this weekend possible. Uh, so a special thank you uh, to Chong Zong Mo, along with Dr. Chua P. Zong, who are both professors at UW Oshkosh, um, but who have also been co-organizers of this symposium. Uh, so I've met both of them, you know, here and there throughout the years, um, but when we finally got to meet in person, in at the opening, you know, I was just really inspired by the work that they were doing as curators themselves. And so I knew that uh, having them on board to help us shape a meaningful and poignant experience this weekend um, was going to be very important. So thank you. Uh, I also really want to thank the John Michael Kohler Art Center, of course. I'm a guest curator, and I've been coming here uh, throughout the last two years to work on this project and to work with amazing artists and community members. So thank you to Jody Throckmorton. Thank you to Anne Brusky. Uh, thank you to Tanya Geyer, who's you know been working relentlessly behind the scenes, really finessing all of the details behind this weekend with all of the other amazing JMCAC staff members, including Sheila Yang over here. Um, and so everyone has been you know just so critical Goal to the development of the Cloth is Land exhibition and symposium uh, from working with community members, uh, community organizations, and supporting uh, not only myself, but really all of the artists who we've invited to be a part of the show. I also want to extend my thank yous to Kaying Yang, um, along with Ka Oscar Lee, who co-curated the Cloth Origins Textiles from the Hmong Journey show. Um, and so that show was a really important part of the Cloth is Land exhibition. It opened back in October, so a month before Cloth is Land opened. Um, and it closed in January, so it's not up right now. Um, but it was really critical in contextualizing cloth um, and also contextualizing the matriarchal legacy um, of cloth and textiles. And that show highlighted the works of various female artisans from throughout the Southeast Asian diaspora. Um, it also uh, honored uh, an artisan here in Sheboygan who's been here for the past 40 years, Sao Yang Li, um, whose work is uh, also up in Cloth is Land, um, who's also leading an applique workshop this afternoon, and who has really just made a really indelible mark uh, in Sheboygan. Um, and as Anne mentioned, you know, this weekend couldn't be made possible without partnerships with the Payne Art Center and Gardens, along with the Wisconsin United Coalition of Mutual Assistance Association, or WACMA. So up at the Payne now is an exhibition on the works of uh, the Fanthao artist Mao Lor in Oshkosh. Um, and that was curated by Chong Mo. Um, and also it features a collaboration between Mao and Jur, one of our very own artists here in Clothis Land. And so, you know, I think these types of overlaps are really important and crucial and critical um, to building out an art community and also an art coalition that can be seen uh, through the symposium this weekend um, and couldn't really be made possible uh, without the support of institutions like the Kohler, the Payne, um, along with organizations like WACMA. Cloth is Land is the first exhibition of its kind to bring a group of artists together in naming Hmong indigeneity. The show decolonizes our understanding of Bandao to position indigenous Hmong worldviews that can be seen in the aesthetics of Bandao and of art uh, that continue to support us Hmong as a people of diaspora, a people of diaspora and a people without a country. The show moves us beyond the binary notions of art and craft or traditional and modern to showcase a range of art from the 1940s up to the present day that challenges the way we understand Hmong textiles along with how its forms continue to change and represent Hmong experiences, being a flexible medium that can convey grief, anger, hope, and desire through the lens of the Hmong American experience.
There were so many important questions that came together, you know, out of putting the show together. And that's what brings us all here today to this symposium. What is Hmong art? What does it mean to be a Hmong artist? How do we care for Hmong art? And how do we craft narratives around exhibitions as academics, social justice advocates, and artists ourselves who are emerging in the field of curation? We'll be exploring these questions through four panel conversations that take place both this morning and tomorrow morning. And in doing so, we hope that we can spark interest and greater appreciation and inspiration in these topics, but also continue and connect critical dialogues. Along the lines of challenging the way we have understood Hmong art, we want to ensure that this event would not only be a place for us to look and to listen to art, but also be a place to be fully engaged in the practice of it. And so as of such, we also have three workshops each day taking place in the afternoon after lunch. And if you haven't signed up for the workshop, I understand you can sign up at the front desk. It has been really such an honor to curate the Cloth is Land show, as I've already stated, and as much as I want to thank our co-curators, our co-organizers, all of the institutions that have made this possible, um, I think also some of the greatest things have to be given to the artists um, whose labor and vision really shape the narrative of the show and of the space, and even of my own ideas uh, coming in as a scholar and a researcher. So to start off this symposium today, we are going to begin with a much anticipated conversation between the artists of Cloth is Land and Cloth Origins. We'll be diving into uh, their practice and their work um, and hoping that that sparks uh, insights into Hmong artistry and Hmong art. So first and foremost, I wanna invite our first artist to the stage, Cha Her. Cha is an interdisciplinary artist current living, currently living and working in Columbia Heights, Minnesota. She received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Studio Arts at the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2016. She is also a wardrobe stylist for Femme Rital, an online secondhand clothing store, and creates earrings under the brand It's Pronounced Cha, established in 2021. Drawing from her second generation Hmong American experiences, her confronts, contemplates, and grieves the wounds of her family system, as well as the overall trauma and displacement of the Hmong people. She uses textiles and embroidery to share her story with conviction and care, and to make sense of her religious trauma, sexuality, mental health, body insecurities, and Hmong identity. Her also incorporates other mediums into her art practice, such as poetry, fashion, social media, photography, sculpture, and installation. She engages with the tensions of belonging by rejecting the white gaze and grounding herself in the spirit, resilience, and strength of her ancestors, uncovering the ancient wisdom that's been passed down from generations through Bang Dao and oral storytelling. So if we could give a warm welcome to Cha. Our next artist is Nzo Xiong. Nzo was born in Thailand and immigrated to the United States in 1993 as a Hmong refugee of the Vietnam War. As one of a stateless people, he creates works that explores the navigation and negotiation of cultural identity from his Hmong American experience through the lens of assimilation, colonization, and migration. Jer's work has been exhibited throughout the US and has also been published in Australia. His work primarily consists of metals, jewelry, adornment, and textiles. He was a Fulbright scholar, or perhaps still is, who researched, documented, and collaborated with Hmong artisans working in silversmithing and textiles in Chiang Mai, Thailand. He received his BFA with an emphasis in metals and jewelry at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater and his MFA at the New Mexico State University. So let's give Nza a well round of applause. And then last but not least, we have Ka Oscar Lee. So Ka is a Hmong artist and cultural producer connecting conversations through visual stories, textiles, installations, and gatherings. As an immigrant and child of refugees, their practice explores how culture is living and dynamic ancestral power that can manifest futures. Even without words for art and queer in the Hmong language, there is undeniable existence. Ka is a co-founder of Oshia Creative, Oshi Creative, a Hmong women's and genderqueer artist collective creating and playing in public and community spaces. 
Ka has been a fellow of Springboard for the Arts in 2020, the Intercultural Leadership Institute, the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, Forecast Public Art, the Jerome Foundation, the Camargo Foundation, and the McKnight Foundation. So let's give a welcome applause to Ka. So through this artist conversation, um, you know, we're really hoping to dive into each of the artists' practice um, and how it's, it's re related to cloth and, and bandao, which in the Hmong language means flower cloth, um, and really uh, discuss the themes of the exhibitions uh, through your work and your contributions to both exhibitions, um, but also provide a glimpse into the world of contemporary Hmong art, um, which can feel elusive to some people. Um, and so, as the curator, you know, I, I've been asked, <laughs> um, how did you find these artists? And I thought that was a really interesting question uh, because for me, I've been following these artists for years. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I, when I was approached with, with, you know, the idea of developing a contemporary art show, which was very different for me because uh, I had been developing shows just around historical textiles, uh, my first thought were these people. Um, and so I thought we could just start out with each of you uh, sharing a bit more about your journey into art uh, and also talking a bit about your practice. Hello, everyone. This is on, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming in um, to the symposium and thank you for Pacha and everyone else involved for the show. It's really awesome to be here and to be one of the artists in Cloth is Land. Um, yeah, my journey with art started when I was young. I like drew my stuffed animals and stuff, but um, I didn't really have a gateway or opportunity to pursue that more until high school, my senior year of high school. And so once I took an art class in high school, I was like, this is it, this is like what I wanna do. I always tell this story that my mom wanted me to be a pharmacist and I was like, okay, I'll do it. But then I'm like, I don't even like science, so I don't know why I agreed. But um, yeah, art became like um, a way for me to really like uh, find my voice and understandings of who I am as among American women here in the US. And um, with fashion too and art really gave me an avenue to explore more parts of myself. And so I went to community college, um, I got an associate's in arts and then I transferred to the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, I got a BFA in studio arts. This was back in 2016. Um, and since graduation, I've just kind of, you know, dabbled my art here and there, but um, um, I explore themes such as um, being among women, um, thinking through spirituality. I grew up in uh, the uh, Hmong church and Christianity and understanding what that means too, as I also explore what um, shamanism is and how that plays a role in the Hmong psyche and also just understanding yeah, spirituality and ancestorship. And um, yeah, I think a lot of my work speaks towards, um, yeah, just owning myself, owning who I am and having confidence in, yeah, my experiences, especially as a plus size woman and and navigating kind of like in the in-between spaces of um, growing up Hmong. And I grew up um, with, um, in a very small population in Illinois and on just, um, consuming, you know, Western media too, and um, not understanding, yeah, just feeling tugged between like both worlds. Um, but now I think I'm understanding how much important mental health is too, and how that plays a role in understanding um, who I am and ha having agency in, um, yeah, everything to be honest. But, um, and so the work I have in the show is called On Agency and Following My Gut. And I think we'll probably get into this more, but I, yeah, I'm just journeying through understanding what, um, like I said, it means to be a Hmong woman and being part of the diaspora from Asia and, um, yeah, and, and how I explore that through my body. So I also, um, I mainly work in textiles, but I'm also interested in other mediums, such as photography, social media, installation, um, sculpture. And so, um, yeah, I think that's it for now. 
All right. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, so I think for me, I, I, I took a pretty traditional art route. I went to do my BFA and then my MFA. Um, so I've always been in academia since for like almost a decade. Um, so I think when I first got into the art world, um, when I was a kid, I was always interested in the arts. Um, I like telling people that um, we used to always play Monopoly, and I always chose the artist, even though it was like under 30K. It was really hard <laughs> to go through that map as an artist, but uh, I was very interested in just, uh, I've always been interested in working with my hands and thinking about art uh, in general. Um, so a lot of my artwork revolves around like kind of navigating and negotiating uh, my Maori identity within like dominant spaces, how to kind of reclaim identity and what does reclaiming looks like. Mm -hmm. And then how do I kind of reimagine what Hmong craft and Hmong art is um, through, through my practice. Um, so I work primarily in metals and jewelry, uh, textiles, and then kind of dabble into some performative and object-based work from time to time. Hi everyone, Yajong. Um, so for me, it's kind of a mixture of a lot of things. So I grew up, uh, I was born in France, and my parents are refugees from Laos, and uh, like a lot of us here, and so uh, the refugee part. Um, but when I grew up in France, I grew up with, in a town where there were no other Hmong families. And so for a lot of my childhood, um, I didn't know what Hmong was, and I couldn't explain it. And I think when I came here to the US, it was a culture shock because Hmong people, especially in Minnesota, are like your neighbors. They're the drivers, the bus drivers. They're taking public transit. They're uh, merchants. Um, they're farmers. And so that was a really um, a beautiful experience. But also, I felt so disconnected from that experience as well. I didn't speak Hmong or English when I came here. And so I had to learn my culture, and I had to learn American culture and society and how, where I fit in. Mm -hmm. And so my entire journey has been about finding my place in this world. Um, and then also thinking about my work as um, a community organizer. I came into art because there were no other spaces to express myself and to learn about my culture and my history. And the way that I actually learned from that was from other Hmong artists um, doing open mics. Um, and so that was like a huge eye opener for me. Um, I'm predominantly self-taught, um, but I came into fiber arts because of my mother. She was a seamstress for most of my life. And um, just the, the presence of textile in Hmong culture, regardless of language barrier, regardless of like your abilities to connect to culture, I think when you see something that's Hmong in textile, you recognize it right away uh, for a Hmong person. Um, and so that was a language to me that uh, welcome me into my own community. Um, and so the work that I create is through a queer, non-binary feminist lens. Um, and it's always going to be because as much as our communities have progressed, I think there's a lot of colonial and patriarchal um, traditions that, or practices that have become tradition when in reality we, ha we are way more um, nuanced than um, just the binary. And so. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it came through performance at a young age because dance is one of the first entry points for a lot of Hmong women. Uh, and eventually it came through textile um, and then later on more like sculptural work and installation when we're not able to be present in spaces. How does our work live and occupy a space if we as people are not visible or mm. um, are not in these spaces? So. Yeah, thank you. And um, as you all were speaking, you know, I think a really interesting point about all of your work is is that you do emphasize um, working with the hands, and you know, uh, working with cloth is essentially working with the hand. And I wonder if you can provide some insights into like how that might play a role at all um, in your practice, and maybe just elaborate more on your practice as well. Uh, I can go first. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I think, like craft based wise, like I, I'm always interested in just lineage, the ideas of 
uh, the hand-based process, how that's kind of passed down from generations to generations. Um, so who, who was before me, right, uh, whether it's through the academia world or within our Hmong community. Mm -hmm. uh, so oftentimes when I'm thinking about like craft-based hand-making with my hands, I think about uh, the process of kind of stitching that same patterns that a mother has done uh, and then their, great, their mother has done and kind of like this this kind of transitions of lineage, right? And then also mm -hmm. kind of how my my training as like an uh, artist within like the Western world fits into that. Um, so like I, I think about that when I'm making, um, cutting kind of like the spirals, these designs that have been made for so long, um, there's kind of power into that. Um, and I think there's also kind of, um, a lot of, let's see, um, a lot of ideas and a lot of, yeah, a lot of power that comes into the process of making um, when I'm creating. And Jer, like, I think, uh, as I mentioned in your bio, you um, you did a Fulbright mm -hmm. uh, fellowship, or I think that's full mm -hmm. fellowship, in um, Chiang Mai. And, you know, I think a lot of your work also responds uh, very much to the commercialization of, of Ban Bao and of, uh, of fashion to some degree. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, um, so about the Fulbright, yeah. Um, so when I was doing my Fulbright in Thailand, I was very interested in um, the commercialization and the commodification of craft in relation to identity, how we've kind of had to kind of commodify our identity to kind of fit and assimilate or to survive into these dominant spaces, mm -hmm. uh, using craft base as a metaphor to talk about um, identity. Um, and then kind of looking at how consumption of Hmong craft has changed what craft history is within the Hmong history. Uh, so how external consumption and also internal consumption has changed like the colorations, the patterns, and the symbols of, of the craft-based work. Um, so as you know, like Thailand, like the economics kind of rely pretty heavily on tourism. So like I was very kind of looking at like if people are kind of buying these kind of objects, do they know what like, the relationship or the history of those objects are? And then mm -hmm. if things are printed and not handmade anymore, do that still have the same value um, mm -hmm. to, to our history? Um, so kind of like challenging these notions, um, thinking about these ideas of com commodifying and commercializing craft is craft. Yeah. yeah. And then I just want to bring us back to the question of working with, with hands and see, what do you? How do you both yeah. integrate that and think about that as you're making? So I feel like um, innately I have this desire to create with my hands, even though the world has moved into a very digital space. I think that it's a great tool, but I always feel compelled to come back to work with my own hands, uh, with my own abilities, my own body. And I think there's a lot about that that's very Hmong. Uh, before the com uh, commodify, uh, commodify is before common. <laughs> I can't even think of the word. Okay, before Hmong uh, clothing began to be so sold, um, people made their own um, clothing by hand, and everyone made absolutely their own um, garments, um, their own everyday tools. Um, mothers of the families uh, were responsible for making clothing for the entire family, uh, and then some. And so there's a lot of pride that goes into making with our hands, and I feel like that's something that I inherited from my ancestors. Um, I will also say that in that process, I think I've learned to reclaim my narrative and my autonomy, mm. um, again, from like dominant um, narratives or narratives that seek to erase my existence and those like me. Um, and that's very common. Um, and so again, like textile has been a way of like liberating myself from cultural rituals. Um, for instance, as a Hmong daughter, I'm not invited to rituals. Um, and then if I'm invited, there's a specific role that I need to abide by. Um, and that makes me deeply uncomfortable. And I feel like through creating, through being an artist, that's been um, a way to reclaim my culture, my love for my people in a way that I can't do in tradition and uh, traditional mm -hmm. rituals. Yeah, I feel that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I think um, using my hands just allows me to really slow down, especially living in this very like on the go capitalistic world. Um, and yeah, I was mostly self taught. Like I, my mom sewed and my grandma sewed growing up. But um, you know, with immigration, you know, my parents are just has to make ends meet, and so I. Yeah, I, I didn't start really working actually with like textiles until I. It, 
uh, until my undergrad. And so I think there was just something very visceral about it for me. Um, and I knew I didn't really want to make clothes in like the fashion world, but like creating like these fun dolls that I do, like my story clothes, just um, kind of similar with God, like allowed me to shape my own narrative and like telling my own story and what does a contemporary story cloth look like or um, some of my projects in the past, like my mom has assisted me and just like understanding like the relationship with my mom too and um, how that plays a role, especially here in the US. And um, yeah, I think I also ask questions of like, um, am I Hmong enough, which I think a lot of people do. And there's like this, purity aspect which like makes no sense because it feels so abstract but um yeah i think using my hands in this very like tactile uh, medium has really allowed me to bring it into reality of like what's actually in front of me of instead of like being like floaty in my head i'm just like okay i'm just comparing myself to like just these like um narratives that have been a lot from that have been um here like for a long time and so yeah i think yeah, I think for me it's just like, it's, it's very labor intensive and like, I'm just like, wow, this is like my little baby. Like I've worked on this for so long and um, I think deadlines help. I'm also like, okay, why, did my, why am I sewing? Cause it takes forever and my perfectionism comes through. I'm just like, okay, this is kind of tiring. But like also it shows me too, like how much like I want it to be an everyday practice too of not just being like, oh, I have a deadline so I need to do it. But I think it allows me to see like, okay, like, our ancestors have done this and you know as the diaspora and like fleeing persecution and stuff like they were still sewing like in a sense and like um and so yeah i just am inspired by that um yeah their disability to create even amidst chaos um so i feel like i i see that in my life too of um, I feel like the chaos now is more internal of like, and, and I just kind of spoke about mental health and how important that is too. And yeah, just understanding more of myself personally so then I can also hopefully share my story so others can also be inspired and look into themselves too and just like be who they are instead of being fit into like a box, um, whatever that box may look like for them. So um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there were so many interesting points that came up in everything that y'all said, right? Um, patriarchy, um, this idea of purity and how Hmong are you, mm -hmm. um, and in connection to patriarchy, not having access to these sort of cultural traditions that are accessible by men per se, but not really by women, and how women have really occupied spaces where textiles um, exist and have taken up textiles as a form. And I can see that also in some of the things you all are saying, um, but, you know, you bring up that, that, you know, you work with the medium of story cloth and you're not the only artist on this panel that works in that medium. Jerry, you've also worked in the medium of story cloths. Um, and so, you know, your story cloths, story cloths have historically spoken about diaspora and displacement. And I wonder if uh, you all can kind of share a few words about, um, I know some of you have been to Southeast Asia and then some of you haven't. And so how, do those have or have not really like kind of contribute to, to how you're thinking about your work? Yeah, I didn't, my first story cloth I made was maybe over five or six years ago. Um, when I was inspired because my parents went back to Laos for the first time, I think this was 2018. And so since since um, immigrating here, and so I think during that time I had already graduated um, art school and I took a break because I'm, I'm so tired. Um, and so yeah, I was just like thinking questions of like, what does it mean for my parents to go back to Laos, not even being able to go back to their villages because you know, things have shifted since then and, and, and kind of going back as tourists. And so, uh, and then I was thinking about like a lot of the displays of um, Hmong story cloths now are, you know, kind of shows the migration of the Hmong people. And so I was interested in like making a story cloth of my parents journeying back to Laos. And so that was my first story cloth that I made. And then that also, like, um, I started asking more questions about um, what is what is my own story and how can I use this medium to tell my story today in the US and, um, yeah, um, 
I think that's it because I kind of forgot what else you said. So <laughs> it was a, a really hey, wide question. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think uh, traveling back to Thailand actually kind of gave me a much broader kind of perspective on what Hmongness looks like. Because um, oftentimes when we look at Hmong, we look at actually Hmong Americans. Uh, we don't have conversations much about um, how the Hmong people in Thailand, Laos, even Australia, and all these diaspora countries, how they're navigating their identities, right? Um, so when I was going there, I think it was just a much more uh, eye-opening to kind of just hear and listen to how they're navigating their Hmongness within that dominant state. Um, and I think coming back from that, that experience, um, I think I kind of knew that I wanted to make story cloths in a way, um, just kind of learning what these craft-based works are. Um, so a lot of the work that I was creating with the story cloth was kind of, um, when I was thinking about it, I just think I wanted to kind of recreate what the story cloths were already are, kind of I wanted to include or kind of reimagine what the story cloths can be. Um, and falling into kind of like the concepts and the ideas I was looking at, like assimilation, lost, uh, colonization. Um, so a lot of the story class that I was making was kind of cutting, cutting them apart, mm -hmm. um, cutting the people out of the stories to show kind of the loss and the erasure of people within those spaces. And then also kind of getting into the assimilation process, displacement process as we migrated or displaced into the United States. Um, how, how we had to kind of navigate our, our, our identity within this space. Um, so using kind of just the history of craft as a way to kind of talk about identity. Yeah. Um, I'll share a little bit about my perspective. So for me, I feel like the 90s were really pivotal and so the colorways are really significantly different and the Bundal story class actually, uh, what I learned through community organizing is that it came about um, because of the time when Hmong people were in refugee camps. And so it became something that, um, a way to make a living. So already then we're commodifying the ways that we were crafting. Um, Hmong clothes and Hmong textile is a slow craft. It really is, and it really is a daily practice that a lot of us aren't um, privileged enough to make at this point in a way because of capitalism uh, and then the change of lifestyle. Um, and so for me, in a way, I felt like these story cloths didn't resonate with me and um, it's something that I never considered until other artists uh, like Cha and Jer started creating more work around story cloths. And so um, I'm looking forward to creating something on my own in the future um, with different characters and more vivid um, movements and things like that, like queerness and story cloth would be so bomb. Um, and so when I, when I started doing my work, it was more along the color palettes in the 90s, which is like a lot of fluorescence colors, um, very much like um, excessive or like more, more embellished coin and embroidery uh, and um, um, beading as well. Uh, you can see a lot more of that in the 90s. And so at that time when I was creating, uh, by the time I started creating works in like the 2000s, um, it was a time where we still hadn't quite reclaimed our identity the way we do today. Like mm -hmm. if you go to a Hmong party today, everybody's wearing something Hmong or Hmong inspired, which is beautiful. Um, but like even 10 years ago, that was like a very new concept. And like 20 years ago, we were, to be honest, like we're too embarrassed to wear Hmong clothing in public mm -hmm. because people would think it's strange, it just didn't look American enough. This desire to fit in um, is something that a lot of our generations face and continue to face. And we're in this time where like people are proud to reclaim our identity, our crafts, our work, our history through our own lens and not necessarily through the lens that have been told from other people. Um, and as a people, we're continuously adapting to the land that we're on. And so the story cloth is an example of that. The use of um, nylons and floral nylons is, a, is an example. Uh, the use of silk threads um, 100 years ago is an another example um, that the people today are not necessarily using. Um, and so I think each decade we'll see different iterations of what Hmong cloth and Hmong textile is. Mm -hmm. Very true, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, your comment just reminded me of how much I hated Hmong clothes growing up as a child in the 90s. 
um, and how hard it was to wear on the body and how uncomfortable it felt for me being used to wearing just like, you know, lightweight, movable garments. Um, and then there was really a point in my own personal um, journey where I discovered all these aspects about clothing that I didn't know. Um, and I think that's kind of what led me to thinking about cloth in new ways and thinking about the concept of cloth as land. And so I kind of just want to move us into the actual uh, shows and we can start to maybe talk about your pieces in the show. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, this is the walkway uh, to, to the collections gallery. And the first thing you'll see is this large installation here. Um, and you all can see the screen down there, okay. Yes. Um, and so this is Cha's piece. Um, and Cha, you made this beautiful story cloth um, that really embodies spirit. Um, and the concept of spirit and ancestors. Um, and you also uh, embroidered a poem on the back of it. And I wonder if you can uh, go into your thinking that went behind this piece and tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, so when Pichir reached out to me, this is maybe like three years ago now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was just really um, interested and inspired by what she was thinking about in terms of Hmong indigeneity and just kind of like the outlining themes of like what she was thinking about like land and spirituality and um, yeah just like the cosmos of it all to be honest um, and so I think during that time I was really thinking about okay what is Hmong indigeneity what does that mean and for me I interpret interpret it as um, following my gut and just like Th these moments in my life that um, really paved the way to like where I am now. And so uh, the title of this piece is called On Agency and Following My Gut. I think that's what it is. Um, but yeah, I was you know thinking about kind of pivotal moments of my life and I was able to um, point out four moments where I really followed my gut in changing the pathway of my life. And so the four themes were, the first one was um, finding style and fashion and thrifting in the age of 14. Um, the second one is finding art around in the end of my high school. The third one is finding uh, community. And then the fourth one um, is uh, moving to Minnesota and finding even more deep uh, community and like um, in like um, thinking about kinship um, and beyond. And so I just, I, my goal is to wanting to do all four of those themes, but I only did, um, I made a story cloth for the time when I was around 14. And so um, here, I think it's, this is the back. I yeah, tell. do you want me to move it? Yeah, in? to the front. Um, so I decided to look back at when I was 14, and so you can see different little like uh, symbol symbols of that, of like MySpace and Zanga when I was like would write away my angsty online. Um, angst and and um, I used to um, doodle a lot on Paint, Microsoft Paint, and so there's some little images of what I did and like. Um, cell phone and just like different things that I was thinking th um, through at the time. And a lot of these are just like photo references from what I could find when I was 14, which is helpful since that was, you know, coming of the digital age. Um, and so then I actually, you know, I was thinking about a lot of things and um, my Hmong is just very average, it's not that great. And I was really wanting to have also like an audio a a component, but then because I wasn't confident in my mom, I was just like, let me just write a poem instead. <laughs> and so um, I ended up writing a poem, which was also translated um, by uh, Caroline Tao, which I appreciated. And to be honest, I don't even know how to fully read the one in Monk. So <laughs> um, yeah, um, the, yeah, the poem felt like it really helped encapsulate my, the whole feeling of what I was thinking through. Um, and especially with like the flowing thread along, um, I thought that I, that for me represented kind of the spirit of like um, my ancestors and really just like holding me down and, um, me following my gut meant that, oh, these are just like 
uh, access points to the resilience of like the Hmong people and making decisions amidst chaos to like survive today. And I see that in like a broader spe perspective of the Hmong, but also my personal life too. And like, where have I made decisions with agency, whether I knew at the time or not to really like um, make a pathway to like who I am today. So this piece really talks about um, yeah, what agency looks like and choosing things for myself and um, celebrating that too and how, to, how, and I wanted to be in like immersive experience and like and celebratory and my goal is to make um, the three other moments I told you, told you all about and um, hopefully expanding it more because I also see it as a time, like a fluid timeline as well and um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just want to say that uh, these symbols on here really spoke to me because I think the first time, I still think the first time I met you was on MySpace when I was seeing you post all of your like fashion <laughs> photos and I was like, this girl's cool, she's from Wisconsin. Um, and so, and then it's funny because, you know, when my partner came to the show and he saw this piece, he was like, oh, the Hmong American story, MySpace, cool. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people people take away so many different things from it, which I just, I love. It, it is joyful and it really is an experience. Um, I think... Someone was telling me that when they bring the preschoolers through, the preschoolers, you were telling me, I think, mm -hmm. that the preschoolers just want to lay there and like look up above. And that's how I feel, you know, being in the space again. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, oh, such wonder. Like, I just mm -hmm. want to look at it. And so, yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I um, we're going to move on to uh, Jer's pieces. And Jer created um, four really amazing pieces for the show. Um, which I really love. And so this is a shot of three of those pieces here. Um, here's a close up of uh, this embroidered sow in many ways that also, uh, to me, like take the form of a shea. And, you know, it's uh, kind of uh, ambiguous in many ways as to what this is, speaking to an experience that you had, which um, I'll let you talk more about. Um, and then this is. Um, a, a chained bracelet, shackles really. Um, and Jer put so much labor. Um, his work really speaks to the labor as we've been talking of commercialization, of making by hand. Um, and he hand carved a thousand Hmong coins to put on this. And so it's quite an amazing feat. Um, and then kind of growing, going back to your Americana iconography that you like to play with, um, you embroidered. Um, the colors and the shapes and the symbols that you've been talking about on on this item, and so maybe I can go back and then you can you can you can even just if you oh, want sure, yeah. talk about it. Is it just uh, this one? Yeah, back okay. and forth. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of the work in the gallery space right now, um, I'm very kind of similar to what Chan was saying when um, Bachia reached out about the show, um, we kind of had conversations about indigenous, the term indigeneity, and our kinship and our relationships to that term. Um, so when I was kind of thinking about this, I was thinking about um, just how much like displacement and loss has displaced me from that terminology. Um, I've never really considered myself like an indigenous person. I think it's because of a lot of like the assimilation process mm -hmm. that has deterred me from using that term on, on myself. Um, but so I was kind of looking at, okay, so why do I, why, why don't I feel indigenous? Why, what are the meanings of being indigenous? What are these terms, right? Um, so I looked at kind of like materiality, belonging, kind of looking at this piece, um, kind of what does it mean to kind of belong in these areas or these lands? Um, so kind of, uh, looking at this piece, kind of talking about when I was doing a show uh, in St. Paul, um, like this person came up to me, kind of pointed at me, and then that's kind of what the title is. She walked towards me, pointed at me, tilted her head, and asked, like, what kind of Asian I am. Mm. Um, so at the time, I was like, I, I kind of chuckled it off, right? So oftentimes, for myself, I'm like, I, don't, I actually don't know how to navigate this. So I really kind of wanted to put that into so to this artwork here to kind of talk about that experience of belonging but also have to continuously kind of tell people that I am Hmong, and then where do you begin, right? Like, where do you begin when people say, okay, what is Hmong? Um, so maybe you kind of have like some sort of like dialogue already on how to kind of talk about your Hmongness, um, but that's kind of like the process that I was kind of thinking about. Uh, and then kind of moving forward, kind of looking at, um, 
like the labor, like what Pachil was saying, kind of the labor, but also the pride of being Hmong. So thinking about cutting uh, these 1,000 coins and having this continuously reminder of telling myself that I am Hmong, mm -hmm. uh, but also kind of the labor that comes behind it, so whether it's, it's like external labor from other communities or internal labors, um, having to kind of, what does it mean to kind of carry this weight of Hmongness on you, uh, having to uh, learn how to sustain language, culture, and history, uh, but also ex ex outside of that, having to kind of educate folks on what Hmong history and culture is. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a bracelet that, uh, I think the video is up, it's a performance piece where I, I wear it on my wrist and then just kind of drag along with me. Um, mm -hmm. And then using silver, copper, and brass as a form of spiritual kind of protection. Uh, and then, and then kind of moving into like these much more Americana, pro Americana products um, and materials, kind of using these materials as a way to reclaim my Hmong identity on top of these very um, global, uh, international kind of products. Um, so what does it mean to kind of um, cut these pieces, these materials apart, um, drill into them, and then kind of attach, reattach, reassemble these pieces together? Um, so kind of looking at like glo like local identities, regional identities, national identities, and international identities, and how like the McDonald's here is much more different than McDonald's in Thailand, right? A lot of that food is really kind of geared towards the food culture there. Um, so it's kind of very interesting in how those those kind of dynamics changes within these these spaces. Um, so very kind of similar to the Coca Cola cans too. Um, this is kind of looking more into like. Um, like loss, re uh, learning, relearning, loss, re uh, refining, reclaiming identity. Kind of, uh, I cut a, I cut uh, Coca Cola cans together and then embroider, attach all the coin, um, the pieces together, and then uh, crumble it, and then re re kind of pulled it apart, and then re it, and then pulled it apart, and then re it. Kind of looking at that process of assimilation, and then coming back to kind of find out what that relearning and reclaim identity, and then that process again, and then the continuous kind of um, navigating and negotiating identity. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, you said something earlier when you were talking about your bracelet, the labor of being Hmong mm -hmm. and of having mm -hmm. to really constantly like educate people. And I feel like I get that so much um, because even in, you know, putting together the show and, and you bring up, you know, concepts of indigeneity that we've been talking about, which we'll get more into. Um, but it is a struggle. Like, what does it mean to be an indigenous Hmong person? And I didn't have any idea as the curator of this show. I had some ideas, but my it was a question, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk about the labor of being Hmong, um, I think people can really feel that in that piece. Um, because, you know, in putting together the show, um, there was this labor in, in telling people again and again, this is who the Hmong are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think some people might feel like that aspect is missing from the show, is this contextual aspect. But I think for many of us, like, we're tired of talking about that contextual aspect. Like, you should get it, or you should do some research. Mm -hmm. uh, because we don't want to keep telling you what Hmong is. Um, there's so many other things we want to mm -hmm. talk about now. Um, and so back to the idea of indigeneity, um, it was very interesting because like uh, Cha said, we worked with a translator in California, Caroline Tao, uh, who just did a really phenomenal job of translating all of the text. Um, and in many ways, you know, she's very interested in decolonizing uh, language um, and how we write in Hmong. Even writing in Hmong is, is a Romanized phonetic alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, and how we translate in Hmong is very like, I'm gonna translate this word for word and it doesn't, doesn't always make sense, right? Um, and so my point being that when she translated indigeneity, <laughs> that was a whole thing, like so many conversations needed to be had, what, how do we translate this term? And then it was really interesting because when it came down to it, we felt like the best term to embody indigeneity was kyakke or kyakke, which is origins, right? And I, just really loved that connection because it connected so much to the Cloth Origins show. And you know, uh, also all of the collection items that were up in the show. And so I, I wanna go to the Cloth Origins show um, 
and just go into the work that you created for it, Ka, because this show really came about, you know, you had done a residency here and you had been coming here quite a lot too. And so when we met, um, I had followed your work for a long time as well. Um, and uh, we were able to put together this Cloth Origins show with Kaying, Red Green Rivers, and um, you were able to kind of uh, morph some of the things that you were doing in the community um, to create this uh, immersive installation as well. And I just, am I missing? Okay, here's this image here. So this is a, a far shot of it. And then you can get in a little bit closer. Um, and I just wanna show this beautiful room that you created um, with an indigo plant, and you can go more into that. Um, but then also you created these pieces that connected to, to your installation and that popped up throughout Sheboygan and thinking about place and displacement. So maybe I can hand this to you and then you can sure. talk more about your work. So for me, having created textile for about like 20 years, um, one thing that became more clear is that I needed to go back to the source of what was before. We had nylon and polyester. Um, and I was able to do that work through a fellowship um, from the Jerome Foundation. And at that time, I got to go to Thailand and Vietnam. Um, and it was pandemic, like the beginning of it. That, actually, I met Jer overseas yeah. <laughs> <laughs> while doing that research as well. And um, I became really interested um, to know like what, where our clothing really came from. Um, and I was able to connect with artisans from Red Green Rivers. And that allowed me to essentially visit my ancestral homelands. Because um, I think of Southeast Asia as an extension of our ancestral homelands, even though um, we are, have been documented to originate from China. I feel like that's the diaspora generation that I'm more closely tied to. And eventually, when I get to visit China, I feel like I will be able to create a relationship and a bond um, to our uh, relatives there. Um, and so when I was exploring the idea of deconstructing where clothing came from, um, I was really interested in like the um, hemp weaving um, which is a practice that Hmong people have held for centuries. And that's how we began creating our clothing, our materials, uh, and supplies for everyday um, life. And then uh, creating that through uh, learning from artisans, that was super incredible. And it just gave me so much appreciation for the labor that goes into just uh, planting, harvesting, and knowing how to care for the land in order to be able to yield these crops and to be able to make materials for everyday use. Um, essentially, uh, that led me to the process of batik, and Hmong batik is very particular too, just like Hmong weaving. We use very specific tools and instruments that uh, we've developed over centuries. Um, so I got to learn how to do that. You can take a workshop with me tomorrow. Um, and um, the significance of like hemp and then indigo plants and how like we essentially harvest the wax and um, all materials from nature. And so every element is derived from nature and there's a deep understanding and respect with the land and resources that we have historically been upon. And I'm part of a generation that has not fully understood that. And I had the privilege to visit our different relatives over overseas and to be able to absorb that knowledge. Um, and so I also went into sil silversmithing as a result because that's such an important part of Hmong dress um, and that represents so many spiritual things but also abundance. Um, all of these different elements represent a, a form of abundance um, that is derived from the labor of the people and the ability to um, make a place home for generations. And because I think I'm part of a generation that has not quite um, lived that out. Feeling like a sense of home anywhere in the United States is arbitrary and also might not feel um, like we have ownership over the places that we occupy. And I think we're just starting to get a sense of that uh, as a people. Um, mm -hmm. So the other things that I was able to do is invite community members to make these pieces with me. 
um, what does it look like to create Hmong symbology, and then what does it look like as we're assimilating to invite non-Hmong people, or the broader public, to consider what uh, cultural symbology means for them and how they can lean into that through Hmong motifs. And so these pieces were created through various community workshops um, with RCS here in the Twins, um, in Sheboygan, um, and then also with um, different uh, community groups. I'm gonna go to this one. So I partnered with uh, different dance groups like the Luna Bellas and um, Korean pop culture is all the rave with the young people these days. And so there's a, a couple of dance uh, K-pop groups that came through. Uh, I did some community workshops uh, where um, I was connected to some really important individuals in the community who helped um, essentially found the Sheboygan community early in the beginning, Yatsi um, Tsevu, he was really kind in my first trips to give me a lot of context. And so I invited them over and over to participate in these projects. Um, and then also I was really intentional about placing them in, space, in spaces that are Hmong owned or Hmong occupied. So this is at the Nyojong Cafe. They have really good food. If you haven't been there, you should go. Uh, it's a family owned business. Uh, the whole family basically um, runs this business. And then the other installation that's not portrayed here is on North 8th Oriental Market. Also check that out. Uh, it's a grocery store and deli in the back, also family run. Um, and so it was really important for my work to be part of the Hmong community and to live outside of institutional walls or in the more public space. Um, so these pieces, at individual squares, uh, have all been created by individuals who will then at the end of the exhibit receive their pieces back um, as a memento of this experience. And um, the way that I was thinking about the installations is that as I was deconstructing the way materials have been created, I wanted to create a sense of newness, of contemporary um, worlds that are inspired by ancestral lineage. Um, and so these different installations represent portals into the unknown, into uh, perhaps our spirituality as Hmong people. There's a spiritual revival in the Hmong community now. Um, and um, it was really, a lot of this work was really possible because of the artists that came before me. So um, Pao Hyo, who was doing a workshop on applique and reverse applique, uh, who was in the exhibit with us, um, she was really instrumental in creating a legacy of Hmong textile uh, that's rooted here in Sheboygan. Uh, it was an honor to be able to um, place my work next to hers and to really contextualize that as well. Uh, and then Red Green Rivers also, I had the opportunity to travel with um, Kaying and also to visit a lot of the artisans in Southeast Asia that helped contextualize, again, my practice and how it's evolving. Um, some people might feel like this doesn't look Hmong, uh, and some people might see it, and so I think that's really a dialogue for community to engage with. Um, and essentially, we started with um, the Pandao um, from Pao Hyo, and then we went to Red Green Rivers with the exhibit to really show like the root of where Hmong textile come from. And then I had the opportunity to really create a contemporary um, uh, trajectory of what Hmong textile where it could take us. And so um, the, ex the installation ends with an indigo plant, and I think of it as like becoming full circle, mm. um, and that everything starts with a small growth and small cutting. So that's a cutting actually was gifted to me by another artist, uh, Shane, um, who's based in California. And uh, I brought it back with me. I didn't know if it was gonna survive, and then we put it in the exhibit, and it thrives, and it still thrives today. Mm. Um, so I feel like the, the practice of sharing and to redistribute resources is something that Hmong people very inherently um, have as a value, and that's how we've been able to survive as people, to be honest. Uh, even if there's no country um, named after us, um, we live by the places that we occupy. And then the idea of indigeneity, um, very much like Winsa said, I didn't really quite identify with that early on, but I really came to understand that through the, the lens of Native Americans here uh, in the North um, American continent and indigenous people uh, here, and to realize that there are nuances and that I am from somewhere too, 
And to retrace that origin is a form of healing, essentially, mm -hmm. across generations, for myself, across uh, ancestors who are no longer with us, um, and then for future generations as well. Yeah, I, I really love that last piece that you said. Um, and I wonder, you know, in creating pieces for the show and thinking about these themes, um, and thinking about a relationship to land and, and what, what is Hmong indigeneity, what does it mean to be an indigenous person? I wonder, uh, how do you think that has shaped uh, your practice, or how do you think those types of conversations add to the landscape of Hmong art? Um, and, and has it changed in any way, or, or, or are these things that you've already been thinking about? Yeah, so I feel really compelled to create through a Hmong lens because I feel like it's a way of reclaiming my birthright mm -hmm. as a Hmong person, um, all the ways that we exist, all the ways that we create. Um, and I think that this is kind of where we are as a community. Um, there's a strong need to like recognize the harm that's been done to us mm -hmm. um, and also the harm that's been done to people who stewarded lands before us. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a way to recognize those different layers is to uh, be in kinship and relationship with land and with people. Um, and again, like I think when I got to visit Southeast Asia, I got to see places where people are like 11 generations deep in their families and what a difference it makes yeah. and how in a way, even though we're in the United States and we have abundance um, based on what, how other people perceive us, there's so much abundance over in our ancestral homelands as well, and it just looks different. Mm -hmm. And it's a way that um, there's a lot of repairing and healing that needs to happen. And I feel like that's why, particularly among American generations of artists now are really gearing their, our work towards that. Um, I think for myself, like just on like a personal level, I think it's helped me just become more patient. Um, with my family members. I think I say that as in like, I remember my mom kind of going back to Laos and my, my sister sent me a video of her there and she knew like all the landscape, she knew all the plants, um, but she didn't have that relationship here. Um, so I think for me, kind of just having more patience with um, my mother and also my family members, um, knowing that our values are very kind of different, but seeing things from their perspectives and knowing that they do have like these, um, these, the knowledge or indigenous knowledge, as we say, kind of knowledges that we may not know of, but um, kind of be more understandable about that. Um, Mong yeah. knowledge. Yeah, Mong knowledge, yeah. Um, for me, I've never been to like Laos or Southeast Asia. And so I think I come from a very American perspective because I was born here um, in the Midwest. And I just hear stories of like my parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles of, you know, um, a long lost land. And I mean, I think that's just a narrative generally as um, Hmong people in the diaspora. And so I think for me, yeah, my, I think I usually need to think about myself first. It seems selfish, but it's like, I think if I, how do I reclaim my own body? personally, so then I can also claim um, a more wider perspective. And I think, um, yeah, growing up in the United States, I kind of talked about it earlier, but I really felt the opposition with like being a woman of color and really internalizing um, my worthlessness in um, white supremacy and just like this wider lens of whiteness. And so when I actually was creating art in undergrad, it was the first time I was like investigating what being Hmong meant, what, what it meant being Hmong. And so I was really operating out of the white gaze and felt like the pressure, like I need to reclaim my Hmongness so like I get the seat at a table and you know, just all these like very overarching, exhausting claims when I'm just like this, Hmong artists in Chicago just like trying to figure it out. And so I think I see the reclaiming in my body as a representation of also a larger lens to hope 
to hopefully inspire others to do the same and and their own like unique ways too and um ways of collaborating and you know getting to know Jer and um guy and also Pahua um and other art artists too because I felt like and as because we've especially for Hmong Americans, we haven't been here that long. And so um, I was just talking to Chong about this earlier uh, during breakfast, but it feels like a lot of the work that we're doing is like pioneer work, which I kind of don't want that because it's so tiring and exhausting. But like, these are questions that I'm thinking through and it's very encouraging to hear that others um, here in the States are thinking the same things. And, 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 and so that I'm interested to also understand what, other Hmong folks around the world are thinking about too, but also specifically like how do, how do I as a Hmong American offer my perspectives and then also look into history and understanding history in a decolonial lens and what, what has, what stories have been passed through old tradition and what, it, what does that look like compared to wanting to find like academic papers that I probably don't really even understand. And um, yeah, how, how do I go back to the personal um, and yeah, reclaim it in that way so that it can also connect to others um, in the everyday and the, um, yeah, just being present with one another, collaborating, having relationships and also grieving like the loss of language, but also how to reclaim that and, um, and with like land and I, I just feel like for me, my understanding of the mind and he just has so much loss and grief, but yet we just need it. We have just like kept going. And so with like being here in America, there is some reprieve, but the, also new challenges of yeah, being in the West and understandings of all the injust uh, injustices here um, as well on top of like understanding what that looks like, what our parents and ancestors have gone through and um, yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, we're coming up on time here, but I did just wanna ask, you know, then a concluding question because um, I think you've touched on so many uh, interesting topics and points too. Um, really the field of Hmong art, because you all talk about um, how you're stretching this aesthetic that's related to, to our historical connection to, to Hmong textiles. Um, and I see that happening in so many different ways. And so, you know, thinking about that, um, really, you've already probably answered this, but I, I just wonder, like, what does it mean to be a Hmong artist to you today? You talk a bit about that, Cha, and then how do you really envision your practice growing? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I mean, I kind of said it a little bit just before, but for me, being among artists is just really, first, yeah, first understanding who I am, and then um, hopefully when I have agency over my own body, I can also have agency in the world, and then being able to reclaim who I am and what kind of symbol symbolisms can I use and I'm really drawn to um bright colors and obviously I'm wearing lime green I mean we're kind of, kind of we're co lime coordinating which is kind of hilariously <laughs> awesome yeah I didn't get the memo <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I think yeah I think I also I, I also see um yeah, Hmong art and being among artists as, yeah, just reclaiming, um, yeah, just clothing and what that looks like and um, through fashion, through like embodiment, through, um, yeah, what do I adorn myself with? What what has been adorned on our bodies traditionally? Um, yeah, and what was the other part of the question? Uh, just how do you how do you envision your practice growing, and you know what do you have next, even? Yeah, so I'm in un, I'm in a grad program right now called Underground Seminary, which talks a lot about um, world history and the Bible and the post colonial lens. And I think learning history has really helped shape who I am, and also understanding 
Hmong history in context of learning world history, and I feel like I have have a better approach, or not better, but just a more well-rounding understanding of what humans have been doing this whole time um, here on Earth, on the Earth. And so I think that has allowed me to really shift my perspective of feeling less than and little and just um, in my own little world, but like having a more global perspective of what it means to be um, among women. And so I think that has really helped shape um, my understandings of having access to history so that I can understand what um, what today looks like. And so, yeah, I will be finishing up that program next year. And yeah, I'm just looking into exploring more of like my art and um, hopefully do more cool things. And um, I don't really have a set plan. I sometimes flirt with the idea of grad school for like doing MFA, but I'm not sure yet because that's also a lot of work. But um, yeah, I'm not it's, it feels pretty open ended for me and I'm excited. Um, I, um, so thank you all for coming and listening. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's just uh, some maybe parting words. Like what, what do you um, envision next? Yeah, um, so I think, I think for me, I'm always kind of thinking about just pushing boundaries of what Hmong art is or what Hmong art can be, kind of reimagining what these craft-based work is. Because um, as you know, right, like culture is not static, like it changes from time to time depending on um, events or just the place that we're in. Um, so, so I really kind of want to push these boundaries of what Hmong art is and what it can be. Um, and um, yeah, and I really always like love and hate the question like what is Hmong or what is Hmong art, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I love and hate that kind of question, but um, uh, let's see. Uh, but what's up next for me is I'll be an artist in residence here in the fall time uh, for three months. So um, I'm excited to kind of work with the space here and then the Hmong community within the space too. So I'm, I'm excited to come back. Awesome. Yeah, for me, I think uh, my work is moving more into installation and sculptural uh, works, and to think of it through an indigenous lens, which means like it's not monuments, it's not concrete, it's not necessarily metal, uh, but it's like what um, the natural landscape has created for us. Um, and then thinking about it through, um, you know, decades, years, millennia of what nature has crafted for us and has like what we've carried forward as a people. Um, and I, I think, I, I mean, my work is always going to be part community, part self healing, part reconnecting um, the dots um, across generations, across realms, thinking about spirituality as a form of art artistic expression too. Um, and then to kind of be anti art, <laughs> in a way, because it's been so uh, institutionalized and professionalized that mm -hmm. it's actually losing sort of its um, roots. And so how do we connect or reconnect or have discourse around that? So. Well, again, it's been an honor being able to curate the Clothis Land show with each of you and really get to know you um, and really revel in your work and your artistry and all the amazing things you are all moving towards, which I'm really excited for. So thank you so much. And if we can just give them a round of applause. Thank you.